In the fall of 1945, the carnage of the Second World War stopped and the world began to reflect on what had just happened. The most immediate outcome was the quiet death of most philosophies of autarky, the idea that any nation could supply all or most of its material wants using only the natural resources within its own borders, however expansive or expanded those borders might be. The war had shown beyond all doubt that pursuing total self-reliance with respect to mineral resources, while philosophically desirable, was geologically delusional. No nation, even the largest and luckiest, had enough minerals to sustain itself. Over the course of the war, America alone had imported $2 billion worth of minerals, or about $31 billion today, from 53 countries. From 1945 on, the focus would be on maintaining reasonable domestic stocks of the most critical elements, but relying more on wide networks of alliance and trade for supply. In these networks, the recently defeated belligerents would be included. That was partly because the Cold War was already reshuffling the world's geopolitical priorities, but partly also because everyone remembered what had just happened when industrialized nations were deprived of the mineral resources their economies needed. Contrary to predictions, uranium did not displace oil as the principal strategic resource around the world. While it did factor into later US and Soviet proxy wars, particularly in Africa, in no post-war conflict were uranium mines or deposits a primary motivator. Uranium deposits are not, geologically speaking, very rare. Any nation of reasonable size is almost bound to contain at least a few small concentrations. Its primary supply is therefore decentralized and difficult to control. By comparison, the engineering equipment and expertise required to enrich the fissionable uranium isotope U-235 is much rarer, and most arms control efforts in the nuclear age have thus focused instead on controlling the development of this enrichment infrastructure. Finally, the Second World War spelled the end of the world's remaining colonial empires. In the two decades after the war, nations across Africa and Asia declared independence from colonial powers now too weakened to keep them. Disproportionate amounts of their mineral and human resources had just gone to supply a war that they had had little to do with starting, and now their populations were understandably wondering why those resources shouldn't serve their own home countries instead. Many of them would harness the new wartime infrastructure, equipment, and expertise to build economies based on mining and oil. If the conflict had been, as one historian described it, an economic struggle for the control and exploitation of the world's strategic minerals, the British, French, Belgians, and Dutch spent 20 years losing the war after the fighting had stopped. The independence of their former colonies cost them the material basis for their manufacturing economies, and so they found themselves in 1960 much where Germany had been in 1930, import dependent, self-sufficient in almost none of the required minerals, and with military capabilities drastically reduced. Over the years, many of the lessons of the Second World War have faded from memory. The U.S. first started trying to stockpile strategic minerals in 1937. Since then, it has rarely managed to maintain consistent supplies. The size of the national defense stockpile has waxed and waned several times depending on the moment's perceived need, security of supply, and economic costs and benefits. What remains clear from history, though, is that the consequences of supply interruptions, which were serious in 1941, would be dire today. Technology is more advanced and being used by more people and systems now than then, and it depends on continued supplies of a correspondingly larger and more diverse range of mineral resources. For anyone interested in analyzing the impact of strategic minerals on warfare itself, the Second World War offers an interesting and relevant lesson. It was the first war that most countries had entered with an understanding of the vital importance of mineral resources and other raw materials. In the modern era, as Erwin Rommel said, battle is fought and decided by the quartermasters before the shooting begins. <laughs> 
but the nations of the world entered the war with vastly unequal ability to meet its material demands. In 1939, some 75% of the world's mineral resource base was under the control of the US and the British Empire, and deep pockets enabled them to sequester much of the rest by paying 10 to 20 times the market cost of ores in neutral countries. To cut off the Germans from the Spanish and Portuguese tungsten ores alone, they paid $170 million, or more than $2.6 billion today, for ore that was worth less than one-tenth of that. Combined with their larger populations, bigger economies, higher industrial capacity, and the security contributed by sheer geographic distance and intervening bodies of water, the U.S. and British Empire started the game holding most of the strongest cards. Meanwhile, the French had folded a good hand early, and the Italians dealt a pair of deuces, tore up their cards, and sulked in a corner for the rest of the game. Continuing the metaphor, the story of the game is not so much how the house won, but how the two main powers of the Axis lost. Japan and Germany had started out with middling hands. Japan itself had few resources at its disposal, but was half a world away from the main theater and faced no real competition as it expanded into the Asian mainland, where it could draw quite a few strong cards. But geography cut two ways. Being an island nation forced Japan to rely on shipping its raw materials by water, and shipping made them vulnerable to the powerful naval forces of the Allies. Beyond that, the Japanese government made a series of losing gambles along with a few dumb moves. Their best hope for achieving any type of resource self-sufficiency was to conquer swaths of Asia while Europe was distracted and America was neutral. That was working when, in late 1941, they attacked Pearl Harbor and then found themselves fighting a mobile war over half of the world's largest ocean with inadequate fuel. Japan had gotten into the war with plans for synthesizing oil out of coal, but minimal actual capacity to do so and a rose-colored estimate of the prospects for success with it. The Japanese military refused to work with the Germans on either their synthetic fuel or their nuclear program, a choice that deprived them of the benefits of German experience with both. The problems were made worse by shortages of critical metals, by putting military officers rather than scientists in charge of research, by rivalry between army and navy research programs, and by continual government interference with private oil and coal companies, conversion plants, mines, and steelworks. Germany had begun with a weaker hand, fewer domestic resources, and more neighbors that could and did contest its expansion but had several compensating advantages. One was proximity to mines and oil fields in the region connected overland without vulnerable sea shipping lanes. The other was prior experience. More than any other nation, the German establishment had learned from the First World War what their resource and materiel situation would be if another war broke out. They spent years preparing for it, stockpiling, scaling up oil synthesis from coal, developing low nickel alloy steels, shifting other steels from molybdenum to tungsten, reducing civilian consumption, forging treaty networks to guarantee imports. Those preparations and the success of their early resource conquests, especially in Eastern Europe, were the main reason that shortages did not start to detract from overall German fighting ability until almost five years into the war, long after the Japanese had started having to restrict operations for lack of resources. Except in North Africa and a few other individual theaters, this kept the Allied superiority in mineral resources from being nearly as decisive as it would have been without those preparations. On the purely technical side, then, Germany had played a weak hand well, perhaps not surprising for a nation that had led Europe in metallurgical technology for the preceding four centuries. But most of that was negated by poor play on the military side. One consistent theme was an overemphasis on producing high-tech wonder weapons, a late example of which was the V-2, at the expense of more mundane tankers, transports, and ground vehicles whose supply was therefore constantly short. Another was early strategic miscalculation. 
the general staff underestimated the German nation's actual steel making capacity until 1941, and on that basis restrained what otherwise might have been more successful blitzkrieg operations. The invasion of Britain, the only feasible way the Nazis could have blunted the British Empire's material edge, was canceled. Instead, the Germans invaded the Soviet Union. This move was understandable given the iron and ferro alloy supplies it earned them, but in the end it cost them far more oil and far more of everything than they could afford. They conquered most of Europe's mineral resources, but it still wasn't enough to run the war machine or the war economy that were required to keep them. Of course, the Second World War was not entirely a tale of mineral resources. Plenty of other factors, geopolitical, social, industrial, military, and economic, also played a role in its beginning conduct and conclusion. But mineral resources were a major and in the end a determining influence, even though their significance tends not to be appreciated. I hope this video series has done a little bit to help change that.